Um, I'd like to talk to you tonight and share my experiences with the uh, Explorer and how it's making a clinical difference in breast imaging at our breast center. We've been fortunate to be working with the Explorer for the last five years or so. Uh, you know, in the past, um, when we uh, were using ultrasound in our practice, it was really a directed ultrasound for patients who had either clinical symptoms or mammographic findings, and it was really just for cis versus solid differentiation. Uh, any solid lesion that we would see, we would biopsy. But things have changed in the last several years as people have become aware of the la poor sensitivity of mammography in patients who have high breast density. And they also know that ultrasound, when supplemented in these patients, can result in the uh, identification of clinically significant small breast tumors, which are typically node negative. So our screening ultrasound practice has continued to grow over the last several years. Typically, we look at the morphology of solid lesions uh, to determine whether they need to be biopsied. Uh, but as I said, most of the solid lesions were biopsied uh, when we were doing diagnostic uh, ultrasound. Uh, the positive predictive value, however, after we started doing breast ultrasound screening is very low, often quoted in the teens. And so that's not anything that's sustainable in a breast practice, and it's not good for uh, patient care, and it's not good if people don't believe in uh, screening breast ultrasound as a supplement to uh, uh, mammography. So as we were looking for a new imaging tool to replace our old ultrasound, we looked for something that perhaps could improve the specificity. And I believe that shear wave elastography was something that was successful in helping us to do that as we added to our grayscale imaging. So for those of you that may not have much experience with the shear wave elastography, this is a transducer generated acoustic radiation which passes into the breast. It results in the propagation of transversely oriented shear waves that go through the breast. And the speed of that shear wave through the breast is proportional to the stiffness of the tissue that it's passing through. That information is then received back by the transducer and an elasticity color map is generated. Tissue which is stiff is gonna be color encoded red and tissue which is soft is color encoded blue. This information can, is also quantitative and you can demarcate on your images regions of interest uh, with specific kilopascals or meters per second. It's interesting if you've seen some of the shear wave elastography images that the stiffest tissue is oftentimes not within the lesion itself but in the tissue surrounding the lesion. And we don't really exactly know why this happens, but it must be due to some type of interaction between the tumor and the adjacent stroma. I believe perhaps some of it may in part be due to the increase in interstitial pressure in the tissue surrounding a lesion due to tumor-induced neovascularity and release of a leakage of proteins and fluid in the surrounding tissue of malignancies. There's been talk and presentations at the RSNA this year is that perhaps this stiff tissue uh, uh, may be a prognostic uh, biomarker uh, uh, for uh, lesions which are larger in size, higher grade, have lymph node positivity, or vascular invasion. So this is going to be interesting to continue to do research uh, in this regard to see whether our shear wave images can be prognostic indicators of um, patient outcome. I just want to talk about one study. This was published by Dr. Berg in radiology in 2012. This was a multinational, uh, multi-center study. Um, uh, was performed at six, 16, uh, images were obtained on, at 16 centers in Europe and the United States, and they obtained 939 uh, solid masses. These were evaluated with grayscale imaging, as well as uh, three acquisitions of shear wave elastography. Dr. Berg acted as a blinded single reader and compared the grayscale imaging alone with grayscale imaging plus shear wave elastography and came up with final BIRADS assessment. The BMO parameters that were utilized included the, those um, directed by the BIRADS, which includes the shape, the orientation of the lesion, and the margins as well as the depth from the skin. And the re reason why the depth from, from the skin was included is that it was thought that perhaps shear wave elastography did not perform as well in deeper lesions. And then she gave a final BIRADS assessment for each lesion. The shear wave elastography par parameters that she looked at included the E shape, the homogeneity of the color image, 
the type of color from blue to red, the E maximum or the speed um, uh, of the uh, shear wave as well as the E mean and the E ratio. And then again, a final bi -reds assessment was given. Looking at the stiffness in uh, kilopascals, as you see an increase uh, from uh, in the E max, um, from low values to high values, you can see that there's an increase in, in percentage of, of cancer. So in tissue that's very, very soft on your elastography images, it's very unlikely they're going to be a cancer. But as the stiffness increases, the likelihood of cancer is going to increase. We saw in performance improvement in the area under the receiver operating curve from 0.94 to 0.62, and also improvement in specificity when we added shear wave elastography to grayscale, and this was statistically significant. If we look at the BIRADS categories, all these lesions were biopsied, 289 lesions were biopsied. There was a positive predictive value of these uh, of 31 percent, which is very uh, good. Uh, a number to have. And if we look specifically at BIRADS 3 lesions, 2.6% of them turned out to be malignant. And at the BIRADS 4A, 9.3%. So this is where we want to be uh, when we're doing screening breast ultrasound and finding uh, solid breast masses. It was found during her evaluation that uh, the shear wave did not really affect BIRADS 2 or BIRADS 5 lesions. You're really not going to change your uh, clinical um, uh, plan for these patients. But where it really became important was those patients who had BIRADS 3 or BIRADS 4 lesions. And what she also found was that the Emax, or red color, as well as the shape of the uh, color uh, image were the most significant uh, findings to predict for, uh, for uh, prediction of um, um, uh, BIRADS. So what she recommended was that perhaps you consider by upgrading a BIRADS 3 lesion to a 4A if the shear wave elastogram showed red color or Emax greater than 160 kilopascals or if the shape, the E shape was irregular. She also suggested that perhaps you consider downgrading a BIRADS 4A from grayscale imaging analysis alone to a BIRADS 3 when you add shear wave elastography if the lesion was dark or light blue, oval in configuration, or an Emax less than 80 kilopascals. And then there was a whole other group which was considered indeterminate, which needed biopsy, um, when they had an Emax between 80 and 160 kilopascals. These are indeterminate. We're not going to be able to do anything. These all need to be biopsied. So this is how I figure, in my mind, how uh, the shear wave is generated. You can see the electronic uh, pulse going into the breast and the, uh, the formation and propagation of the shear wave transversely oriented. So let's look at some BIRADS 2 lesions. They should be down here in the black and the dark blue on our color images. This is a patient with dense breast tissue complained of a palpable mass, and you can see a mixed uh, um, density mass, which is appears to be possibly encapsulated uh, deep to the triangular marker. On, sheer, on ultrasound, we saw a mixed echogenic mass, um, which would correspond to the palpable symptoms. And the um, color map showed homogeneously blue soft tissue. This is artifact related to compression um, superficially. This was biopsy and found to be a hamartoma. So this is a BIRADS 2 lesion. You probably suspected that it may be a hamartoma just from the mammogram, but this gives you added confidence that indeed this is, can be a BIRADS 2. This really does not need to be biopsied. A second lesion, a hypoechoic mass and deeply positioned within the tissue. The margins appear somewhat irregular. Is this something that's solid or is this something that is a, a complex cyst? We use shear wave elastography. Uh, we can see that there's no propagation of the shear wave, so this is uh, typically uh, a cyst. This is fluid here, which does not propagate a shear wave. The Emax here is zero. So in the future, when we see lesions like this, they don't not, do not need to be evaluated by REDS 2. Let's look at some by REDS 3 lesions. That would be the dark and the light blue. This is a hypoechoic solid mass. It's parallel uh, to, the, uh, to the chest wall. We use shear wave elastography and homogeneously uh, soft tissue 
uh, involving the lesion itself as well as the background. This was a biopsy. It was a fibroadenoma, but we could characterize this as a BIRADS3 lesion and follow it up. Another lesion which is similar, parallel to the chest wall, but somewhat more angular, hypoechoic solid mass. We used shear wave, and again, homogeneously blue, uh, very soft tissue. It's no different than the background. Again, this was found to be a fibroadenoma. So we can characterize that. We can recharacterize it from a BIRADS 4A to a BIRADS 3. Another lesion, this is a patient who had an implant. We can see a hypoechoic solid mass, very small, sitting directly on the implant, probably a fairly difficult biopsy. It was biopsied, it was a fibroadenoma, but we can see with shear wave, we can probably avoid having a biopsy because it's a soft lesion. We can characterize this from a 4A to a BIRADS 3. If we look at the BIRADS 4 and 5 lesions, that would be things, the colors um, yellow, orange, and red. Several cases. This is a mammogram where the patient had a new rounded subcentimeter mass in the central portion of her breast. It was a hypoechoic solid mass on ultrasound, a little bit taller than wide. Um, we use shear wave, and we can see that the uh, map is irregular. There is uh, stiffness around the lesion, which extends outside the lesion. This was biopsied. Uh, it was characterized as a, a BIRADS4 lesion. It was found to be a mucinous carcinoma. So a lot of information we get to add to our grayscale imaging by using the shear wave. This patient, dense breast tissue, she had a palpable mass. Nothing was seen on mammography. There was no calcifications, there was no mass, there was no distortion. We do ultrasound and we can see a poorly defined area of mixed echogenicity. Is this just dense fibrous breast tissue or is this something real? Uh, is this something to be uh, concerned about? We use shear wave and you can see the extensive area of uh, marked stiffness in the tissue. Um, this was biopsied and found to be DCIS with comedonecrosis. When we do our um, uh, MRI, you can see the extensive involvement of the disease in this breast here, but certainly nothing was suspected mammographically. Something indeterminate on ultrasound, but clearly when we have shear wave, we know exactly what we need to be doing with this lesion. Another patient had a, a small hypoechoic circumscribed solid mass superficially positioned in the breast. Shear wave elastography again showed that the significant stiff tissue around the lesion as well as involving the lesion, and this was biopsied and found to be a small invasive ductal carcinoma. Another lesion, hypoechoic, it looks parallel with circumscribed uh, lesion deeply positioned within dense breast tissue. Shear wave elastography helps us to determine that this is not a BIRADS 3 lesion, this is a BIRADS 4 lesion. You can see significant tissue stiffness around the lesion, and this was found to be a low grade DCIS. This patient came to us without prior films. You can see she has some dense tissue, a, a history of a previous biopsy, and you can see the scar marker, periareolar. We questioned an area of distortion in the posterior central breast. We thought it persisted on our spot compression imaging, but we did not know whether this is just scar related to her prior surgery or is this something uh, that needs to be evaluated. On ultrasound, the technologist brought these images with some distortion um, in the region of the surgical scar. We use shear wave elastography, and you can see significant stiffness around this lesion, and this was an invasive ductal carcinoma. So it helps you to distinguish something that's typically benign from something that needs to be evaluated with biopsy. Another patient had a large fatty breast. There's a large lipoma here. You can see part of the capsule, and there were multiple uh, um, masses within this lesion that had peripheral calcifications. These were oil cysts. We saw a new density in the subareolar portion of her breast here, about one centimeter in size. That was better seen on the craniocaudad view, an ill-defined spiculated mass. The lipoma is situated here, and the oil cysts are seen anteriorly. We performed ultrasound, and these you can see the lipoma with this capsule, and this is a fat density lesion with peripheral uh, calcification. This is consistent with oil cyst formation, which we were suspected from uh, mammography. Looking at the solid new mass that was seen, again, irregular hypoechoic solid mass with increase in vascularity. 
We use shear wave elastography, and we can see how we can differentiate the benign for the malignant lesion very easily. You can see the marked tissue stiffness around this invasive ductal carcinoma with, this, with the um, consistently homogeneous blue soft tissue in the region of the oil cyst. So in one breast, you can differentiate something that uh, needs to be biopsied from something uh, that you can follow. And this is her MRI T2 weighted. You can see this large lipoma. And these are the small oil cysts seen anteriorly with the peripheral calcifications. And on the MIP image, you can see that there's just a solitary, irregular, spiculated mass consistent with the diagnosed invasive ductal carcinoma. Now, there are false positives. If you use poor technique and use too much pressure, you can uh, simulate a stiff tissue. Uh, this happened to be a hypoechoic mass. Uh, this was early on when we were uh, starting to use uh, shear wave. Uh, too much pressure on the skin can uh, simulate a stiff lesion. This was biopsied and found to be a fibroadenoma. This lesion was a false negative, a small hypoechoic solid mass. With shear wave, it appeared homogeneously blue or soft, but it was biopsied and found to be an invasive ductal carcinoma. So, Nothing's 100%. Uh, you have to use all the information that you have, not only your morphology, but also the information you gain from using your shear wave to determine whether something is safely followed or needs biopsy immediately. And certainly something like this, I don't think there's going to be any clinical implication if you do short-term follow-up. Maybe the next time it'll be a little bit stiffer around, a little bit, it had may have changed in size, and then that would uh, um, cause you to biopsy the lesion. So I hope you've noticed the, the beautiful, exquisite images of the anatomy of the breast uh, from, the, from the Explorer, but also um, having the shear wave elastography has significantly changed our practice. Uh, it's easily implementable into a, a clinical practice. It's operator independent. It's a quantitative exam, so you can do, use, uh, use it for short-term follow-up of lesions, and it's, it's um, definitely reproducible. It has helped us to increase our diagnostic specificity as we're performing more and more screening breast ultrasounds. It's reduced the um, unnecessary biopsy rate for our patients and increased the reader confidence. Uh, so overall, a lot of positive things we've gained. And it also has given us both economic and clinical benefit to our practice. So I thank you very much for your attention.